celebrated skier folks and qualified to smirk. I've skied more hills than any man from Frisco to New York. But talking about the skiing I've done is my one and only quirk. So, Jill, talk to me about how you discovered Aspen and what it was like and what your first impressions were of this town. I first discovered Aspen in December of 1959, and I was with my fiancé. We flew to Denver. It, there was a snowstorm, so we had to drive up. I couldn't see anything. Got to the Jerome Hotel, which was it's an original white and blue brickwork paint, and it was in rather dilapidated condition. So I really didn't see too much. The next morning, there was sunshine. I walked outside, looked around. We had no traffic lights. Main Street was Highway 82, so it was able to be paved. Every other street in Aspen was dirt. There were many vacant lots. There were packs of dogs running around town. And they never bit anybody, as a pack might. People would just let their dogs run free during the day, and then the dogs would go home at night. It was hysterical. And I looked around, and it was so wonderful and pure, and I said, I'm going to live here one day. And I did. <laughs> and RJ, did you come with Jill the first time, or how did you get here, and what were your impressions? Well, I first came to Aspen uh, 10 years before Jill. And uh, I had known, I knew Jill. I'd met Jill before that. Uh, at 20th Century Fox where you were under contract. And you were the big star. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> and uh, I came up here with uh, Yvonne Taché and Yves Latre. Uh, they were two wonderful guys from Europe and professional skiers. Canadian and, Olympians, both of them. Yeah. And uh, they, I, I really, I, I, I was so fond of these guys and we had a great time together. and. That was when the chairlift was put in, and you know, uh, the skiing was uh, right in the heart of Aspen. Well, and, yes, you know. there was no buttermilk. Even when I was there, I learned to ski on Aspen Mountain because buttermilk hadn't opened, and snow mass was just, uh, it was still wild yep. and unimproved, but we did have highlands. And I, I stayed at the Jerome as well, 10 years before Jill. And, uh, I just thought Aspen was great. As she said, you know, there was dirt streets and uh, the lots were, you know, it was, a, it was almost a ghost town. And uh, I loved it. I really loved it. And uh, came back often, many times. And then uh, when Jill and I started going with each other. Decades she, uh, later. Decades later. Um, you know, I, I got next to her. She took me up and down the streets, you know what I mean? Well, I don't know if it would be a deal breaker, but it was very important to me that he wanted, that he loved it here, which was a no-brainer. He did love it here. One thing I'd like to say about those earlier days in Aspen, it was a very different group of people. Uh, there were a lot of very intellectual people. Most bartenders had a PhD or a BA. Uh, they were taking a year off in England, they'd call it a gap year, but, but a lot of really well-educated people would come and live for a year or two and then go back to their real lives, but a lot of them stayed. And that's when I feel we had the big movers and shakers, and I was lucky enough to meet Elizabeth Pepke and, and Fritz and Fabienne Benedict and, uh, you know, so many people that really contributed to how great and intellectual and multi-diverse that Aspen truly is still. Well, well, also at that time, which you and I have talked about several, several times, is that there were a lot of young people here who were working the restaurants, yes, they were. who were taking care of the hotels, who were working the lifts. But and they all were of very that. interesting people because in those days you were a bit of a maverick to go off to a ski town in the middle of the Rockies that most people had never heard of. And those younger people worked for uh, lift tickets. They did. And that was that was terrific. Oh, yeah, terrific we time. all worked for something. I was a I was the hostess at the Red Onion. And I mainly did that so that I could race against the Golden Horn. We had two competing racing teams in those days. And in winter school, you had to be an employee to, to be in the race. And Werner Kuster, who owned it, said, you're the hostess in the dining room. 
I knew nothing about it. I'd already been making movies for years and years. And there I was accepting everybody's reservation, never figuring out, well, that table for six won't be available for two hours. Could we have two by the window? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And in the dining room was Shaika. Not the dining room, the bar. And Shaika married Pepe Gronsheimer. But Shaika had been in Vegas as Yellowbird in a big review at the Thunderbird. And we used to kind of cling to each other behind the bar because everybody would hit on us. So one year, <laughs> really? years later, and you know who Pepe Gronsheimer, the Olympian, was, and they still live in Bale. And one year we ran into Shaika at the Betty Ford Golf Tournament, and RJ said, Whoa, Shaika, what was it like with you and Jill at the Red Onion? And she Boy. said, we killed them. <laughs> Can you imagine walking in there and saying to Jill, could we have a table, please? <laughs> I mean, you've got to hit on her, right? Yeah. Right yes. away. And Shaika <laughs> is bigger than life. I mean, if you go over to Vail, I've known her for a long time, too. It, it, she's effusive. She's, anyway. And Great, huge personality. Christmas of 1964, I was 17, two buddies of mine were walking in down the alley behind the onion, and the door swings open and Arnold Sen, uh, Warner's partner, Warner partner, partner yeah. throws his dishwashers out, they're drunk and he's swearing in half German and half English, and he sees us and he says, you, you want to wash dishes? And we looked at each other and we said, okay, we'll wash this, we're here for the two weeks of Christmas, mm. and we ate. Everything that came back there, that, I mean, people would order the lobster and they'd only eat the tail and we'd eat the cloth. <laughs> and one day we see Cooster giving a tour and it was Bobby Kennedy and he came back and he talked to us for five minutes. And really? It, 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 at 17 it was a very powerful experience. Oh, it would I can believe be, it. It would still be powerful. It, it was Did great. you know that in the old days when it was a silver mining town yeah. that the top floor of the Red Onion was a brothel? My grandfather did business there. No. <laughs> <laughs> they no. had all these little cubicles. It was well, there were a well, lot of brothels aren't, aren't around. The, aren't around the, Aspen. aren't the windows on a lot of these streets in these old buildings there were where, where a lot of the women stayed? Possibly. That's well, what I heard. You it could Nell, easily be. Nell was supposed to be a madam. Little. Uh, so I'm sure, and so I don't think she was so little either. <laughs> Let's go. Back again, your your re recollections of the. I mean, I remember when there were dirt streets too, and the town smelled different in the summertime because you could smell that that the dirt. Septic. <laughs> um, the septic. Uh, the let's talk about the attitude of Aspen then and maybe now as well, but toward celebrities, toward welcoming people s uh, such as yourselves. It seems to me it's had a, it's it's an unusual place that way. Uh, that it gives you space and. Can you talk about any of that? Well, you know, uh, Aspen, I mean, it, it's, they, they've always been open to celebrities, you know, and, uh, and people are always so, you know, I, th I think people are so happy to be here that uh, that's the main thing. It's so very they're, they're, accepting. Yeah, so they're, all they're already up. So when they kind of run into you or something like that, they're always, you know, but Aspen was under the radar for many years. And a lot of celebrities would come here and nobody knew the difference. And then Spider Savage was killed. And suddenly every news service from all over the world descended on Aspen. And that's when the word glitz was invented. And suddenly Aspen was on the radar and it wasn't our small, quiet little town anymore. You want to talk about how it's changed and what you miss about the, the past? Well. Well, it certainly has changed a lot visually. It's disappointing to me that downtown Aspen now has buildings that are really not in keeping with the flavor of Aspen. We had all these, we were lucky enough to have all these wonderful original Victorian buildings. And it's heartbreaking to me to see something much more modern thrown up in, in place of it. But there's also another dynamic. There were a lot of people who would come here and they, they might be very wealthy, but you didn't know. Now there's a very large contingent that wants you to know. But and I think that's, uh, that's kind of everywhere. A, everywhere it's you know? everywhere. I mean, I'm sure he's right about that. But it, also it used to be that you kind of, everything was low key. Everybody had a truck. You had a, a dog and a broom in the back of your truck so you could sweep 
sweep the snow. And now everybody's, and I'm one of them, has a Mercedes or a Tesla. <laughs> RJ, when you first came, did you ever think that you might actually live here? When I first came here, did I actually think that I was going to live here? No, I didn't. But I, I, I responded so positively to the to the mountains and and to to Aspen and the people that were here, and uh, I, I was raised in Michigan, and uh, th this is some sometimes it's very. Uh, I, I have the sense that I'm back in Michigan sometimes when I get a whiff of wonderful smell of pine trees. And, and, uh, but to answer your question, uh, no, I didn't. But when I, Jill and I started going together, uh, you know, I just found that it was, it was so wonderful and such a wonderful place. And then as I started to settle into it and with her, and then she introduced me to some wonderful people. And uh, w our relationship really grew from here, oh, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know. I am convinced that living in these beautiful surroundings, being immersed in nature as most of us are every day, I think it prolongs your life. Well, there's a few people around here who are examples of that, like Klaus Obermeier. Klaus oh, Obermeier yes. is, is the guideline for that. Yeah. Um, I always say to people when they ask me what this is like, it's the most cosmopolitan small town in the world. That's what I call it, a big city, a, a small city filled with big city people. But there's so many people that have so many different values here. You know, people are involved with the institutes, people are involved with... Uh, the music. So, the music, uh, with skiing, with snowboarding. I mean, it's just, you know, it's an amazing... I think this valley has... Uh, and we've always both said this, has got a wonderful magnetism about it. The, the Roaring Fork Valley over the years, I mean, has just... So many movers and shakers and big thinkers and forward thinkers have come here and, and left a great mark. You can kind of get it all. You know, you kind of have it all here. It's a unique place, for sure. Have you got um, some special memories of, of the two of you together, things that have happened here? Oh, but I can't tell you. <laughs> you know, I have we, lots of memories here. I mean, to we've been so fortunate uh, that we've been able to to uh, Jill had her home here, and she sold that, and then we bought another one, and we made it ours. And uh, honestly, we really wake up every day and say thank you, thank you, thank you. We really and do, and I have never. I've lived here. Oh gosh, I've been here more than 50 years. And I never look at the view. I never wake up in the morning or walk outside or take a look that I don't go. Still, after all these years, I'm not jaded to it. I'm, uh, all I do, we live in gratitude. We're so grateful to and be here. And what about the golden light? And yeah. the, in that hour between five and seven, there's especially where we live up high at 9,000 feet, there's that golden light. And you think of all the French Impressionist painters and how they used to go for that light in the south of France. And here we have it in our, on our lawn every afternoon. What do you think about the way it's, it's changed? What, what might you miss from before, uh, whether it's uh, people or a social attitude or smallness or vacant lots or has well I think that I think the way that it's changed and the changes that have occurred here uh, have happened to all of us everywhere with the advent of technology and uh, I think that you know we're trying to hang on to the basics here, you know, that, I mean, Jill and I are, and there's a lot of people that want to make it different and uh, bring in their own ideas, but I, uh, I think that's happened all over the world, you know, with corporate influence, with technology, with computers, all of that. I mean, it's changed every place that we've Everywhere gone to. Everywhere we go, we e see you know, the kind place. of change we've seen here, but I miss, I miss the fact First of all, it's way too expensive for m most people to live here. And I miss the fact that there was an entire group of people that could no longer live here. They either had to go down valley 
because they couldn't afford the real estate prices. And these were interesting, fun, vibrant people. They can't make it here. And I've often wondered why any business thinks it can make it in a resort that really only has seven months a year of paying customers and the rest of the time you're empty. And two of our daughters were just here and they love it, you know, and w one of the husbands wanted to uh, look, start to look at property, you know, loves it here, would love to live here, would love to have this. I mean, we're all so fortunate to have it. And it was just out of the question. Yeah, they're priced I mean, they out. Can't, they, you know, you most know, people priced are priced out. out. So it becomes the haves and the have-nots in a way. And that's a shame. And it wasn't that way at one time. One of the things I say it was a change is that I felt there was no social stratification. There never was. It was a classless society. It was. You want yeah, there to was talk never a social a thing. More? I mean, because uh, that to me was a. You go to a party and there'd be a ski patrolman and a doctor. Exactly. And, yeah. There you, were you're you, uh, yeah, would you talk about that a little bit. There were yeah, yeah, the I miss I miss seeing the workforce when I go out. You know, I've lived here long enough, and, and one wonderful thing about Aspenites, we may not know each other's name, but if we see each other on the street more than once, we say hello. And you try that in the city, they think you're crazy. But I miss, I miss a lot of really good people that we can't have anymore. But They've that been priced that, out. Yeah, but honey, you know, that, that aspect is gone in a lot of ways with the advent of cell phones that the dimension there's another dimension out that's gone you know yeah. that that of uh, being able to connect with somebody there they don't have anybody to relate but to but a party right? would be much more diverse because like you said before there might be the ski lift operator and then you might have the head of the institute nobody cared everybody merged together it, it was a wonderful party all of them and there certainly have been a few parties in this town now everyone wears jewelry and sequins and i'm going wait a minute i'm used to going to a party and just a pair of slacks and a blouse not anymore what about so why aspen why didn't you go to vale or jackson hole or sun valley or many reasons well you the, the reasons i think the reason that we i mean the, the difference between why we didn't go to Vail or why we didn't get someplace else is that Aspen is really a, a, a wonderful community. You know, we got a police department, a ballet, music. Yeah, well, we've uh, got. You know, it, it's a, it's a, it's. There's a there there. You know, I feel that with Vail and Sun Valley, there was no there there. There were condos and ski lifts and shops. It was created. Here we have a, a great infrastructure. We have all the cultural, I mean, don't we have a ballet and an opera, a theater company, the music, the jazz. We have all of that. We have the institute. We have so many things that a person doesn't have enough time in a day to get them all done. You can't attend every lecture. You can't go to every concert. There just isn't time. Which makes it to me, the most unusual place in the world. I, I mean, oh, yeah. I had the good fortune in my television career to go everywhere, and I never saw a place that, I mean, even San Moritz or. Oh, yes. I never saw any place like this. Nor did I. When we first started going together, he had a chalet in Stad. And we'd go with the children and the nanny and everybody, and we'd get there, and uh, it was not Aspen. And after a couple of years, I said, gee, it's snowing in Aspen, and I know someone who has a house there. Me. And we didn't go back. Did you, did, was that upsetting? No, uh, well, both Jill and I have spent, fortunately, uh, a good deal of time in Europe. I lived there for a while, and Jill lived in London for a while. And we were working. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't a, a disappointment for me to give that up, or for Jill to give up what what she had in Europe and come here because this is so special, and it's uh, it's uh, it's home. You know, it's a home for us, and uh, we live here permanently now. We had a, a wonderful, beautiful home in Los Angeles, and I was working there a lot, and so was Jill. And suddenly, we have three daughters, and they all left, and we're all we're looking at each other, and it's just saying, us and the horses. So yeah. we had horses at the house, so we decided to sell so, and move up here permanently. Which so, I have always been a Colorado resident, and then he became one years ago. 
so that it's been a, a wonderful, wonderful thing for me. I, I must say this is to spend uh, my life here uh, in this environment has been absolutely a blessing, total blessing for me. It's a gift to all of us to live here. Any other anecdotes that you think um, reveal something about Aspen uh, hmm. with either people or, uh, I mean, it, how about some of the characters that, that do you remember <laughs> going to uh, Ralph, whether it's Ralph Jackson or? Oh, Ralph Jackson, of course, I remember him so well. And uh, Verna Cooster from The Red Onion was quite uh -huh. a character. Uh, we've had a few. I think my favorite character and turned out to be one of my closest friends was Patricia Moore. She was a hell of a wonderful lady. lady. She wonderful was so lady. interesting. Well, so was Elizabeth Pepke, and oh, I, God, yeah. I had the the real privilege because Jill knew all these people of being introduced to them and spending time with them, and they just such special people. General uh, Robert Taylor. Oh, General and, Taylor. And he, yeah. you know, Mortimer Adler. Mortimer and Mortimer Carol. Adler and, and uh, I had a, a chance to be around those people, and they were the ones that really put the juice in this, you know? The Pepkis put the juice in this. And they really did. It, did the, you ever meet Walter? Did you? No. No. Talk about Pussy Pepke and uh, what, what she was like and, and what, if you, if what you recall of her and, and that. Well, Elizabeth, Pep, Elizabeth Pepke, when Jill introduced me to her, I, I mean, I, I just was, I just fell in love with her. Those I just, blue eyes. Those blue eyes, and she liked me. And uh, she had a great sense of humor. And of course, that, that helped to kind of, for me. And, and she was so, so nice to me, so, so dear to me. And I was, she was one of the most special ladies that I ever had the privilege of meeting. She was great. She could be funny. She was very intellectual. She was quite strong. She was amazing, and she had this wonderful garden on Helen Lake, and as you know, she, she gave ACES, she gave all that property on the lake to ACES. Which is a great organization, with many, brother. Yes, we, we support ACES with many, many things that I had. A, she showed me, I could go in her garden anytime. She would kept a key on a nail in, inside a tree, so you, you knew where it was and you could go. And we, we had some fun. We'd go to the movies oh, together. Yeah. And, she was great. great. I remember once I sent her some flowers for something. I don't remember what it was. And she called me up and she said, oh dear, thank you so much for the lovely flowers. I put them in the prime minister's bedroom. <laughs> I thought, that's her. <laughs> what, um, what are the most special things that you, you think you've done here that you couldn't have done someplace else? Is there something about Aspen that... Uh, I grew up. That was the most special thing to me. I grew up. I learned to live in gratitude. You can't, you can't look at this beauty without knowing there's some sort of higher I think power. That's Call very, it what you want. I think that's very true. I yeah. think that's absolutely true. You look at it and you live in gratitude. That's really, really on it. And that's the way we live. Yeah. Anything else you guys would like to say about your life in Aspen and You've, I'm just thinking you've described it really well. Um. Well, let me tell you something that comes into my mind about recently, uh, something that comes into my mind about Aspen, is uh, we had our granddaughter here, five years old, who was fortunate enough to ride in the parade because uh, our fire chief, Rick Ballantyne, is a friend of ours, and he put her on a number one fire engine. For the 4th of July For the 4th of July parade. I rode with him in his Jeep, spraying the people with, with water. And I looked back and I saw my granddaughter, our granddaughter, on the number one engine. Not bad. Good stuff. Well, you, you bring up something. Um, that wouldn't happen in L.A. That wouldn't happen in no. New York. Um, it's so this town, obviously, it, it it knows your celebrities. It knows what you've achieved in your careers. But at the same time, it welcomes you in a different sort of way. It treats you as members family. of the community. It treats you as family. If you wait 
and take it in, you'll be a very fortunate person because it'll find you. It'll find you eventually if you wait. Beautiful, beautiful place. And we're so lucky and so fortunate to be a part Aren't of it we? and to be able to live here. Do you ever feel, um, because of your renown, your achievements, uh, that the town has tried to exploit you in any way or? Uh, I've never felt exploited no. by this town in any way. And I've tried to return the favor by not exploiting it. I never give, you know, interviews about living in Aspen. It may be one footnote, but it, you know, it, this is home. Yeah, it is home. I wish I'd have come into the restaurant and you would, into the Red Onion, and you had said, <laughs> You'd have to is face that a me table? in Shaka, I'm not so sure. <laughs> you'd, you'd have been coming every night. You'd have been oh, there. I would have been there every night. but. There might have been a lineup for you. Well, I we would beat think the, so. All I can <laughs> say is in the race, the Red Onion beat the Golden Horn, and that's all we cared about at the time. So that brings something up, too. I mean, it's, we've sort of talked uh, about it, but the, the community itself had this um, fellowship. I, that's not the, exactly the right word, but the idea of. Camaraderie. Okay, much better. Um, you, can you talk about that? Uh, this, I remember, and maybe you remember, there used to be uh, at the Onion they gave a, a hospital benefit dinner. The, everybody that wanted to donate wild game did. Everybody came in. You'd go down the food line, and there would be, uh, again, the celebrities and uh, lift operators. And there was, I, it's one of the things I miss, but there was a sense of belonging, belonging and and. You said camaraderie, family, um, that I've never experienced any place else. Can you talk a little further about that? I think everyone, I, don't, I wouldn't say you give up something, but you have to work towards something to get here. Because nobody comes here with a job. I mean, most people don't. And uh, I think we all recognize that we were lucky enough, smart enough to be here. And it was such a classless society. You knew everybody's name. I remember when we used to go to Abatoni's. Oh, yeah, and see Alda. And Alda and... Uh, Romano and, and Dieter could make the big uh, Dieter chef would make salad. The, no, no, Caesar, Caesar salad, salad that Dieter was so the good. They kept Caesar. raising the price because it took him so much time to make it. They wanted... They, and, and then it, did, it turned out he was a flight instructor. I went to learn how to fly a glider, and there was Dieter. And, you thought, remember, hmm. and everybody would be there. At the bar. Yeah. That bar was great. You knew everybody. That's the thing. Between skiing and eating. That bar you and knew Bentley's. Everybody. And Bentley's was a great bar. You yeah, know. but that was a lot earlier. Before it was that, it was, downstairs was the pub. Oh, yeah, that's right. And we only had uh, two markets, and which was preceded the pub underneath. It was Beck and Bishop, and that was underneath the Opera House, and the other market was Tom's, which is where you'd uh, mountaineering is, and the cat slept in the fish counter. And the J-Bar, I mean, the J-Bar was it's great. Always After been great. skiing, I mean, you'd, you'd see everybody in there. Oh, you absolutely. The Aspen Times would come out on Thursdays only, and I would sit at the end of the, of the J-Bar and have my vanilla Coke. It was very nice of Dan to give me a vanilla Coke instead of booze and uh, wait for the Times to come out. And all the little kids would, they, it was their job, the Times was 20 cents, but you always gave them a quarter. And you got your paper and that was it. And then the Aspen Daily News came out years later and that was on one page printed on both sides. And it was free. Now both papers are free. Do you remember Mary Eshbaugh Hayes? Oh, and very oh, well, sure. and we all have her husband Jim Hayes's uh, belt buckles of silver. And mine. Silver Austin And mine came from Pat Moore. And yours came as a gift Pat from Dick. Pat Moore. But Mary Eshbaugh really chronicled everything that happened in Aspen. And it was, it was a great loss of both of them. Is the coziness gone? Are we... Are we yes. We the coziness is gone with the newcomers, it's not gone with the old timers. 
and yeah. eventually as the newcomers become old timers I hope they are lucky enough to get that coziness you know coziness has gone most places yeah I think coziness is gone you know too bad but we were lucky yeah, we got it we were we, we really feel lucky that we got the best of it but it's not bad now for all of the changes and all of the buildings most people may or may not like, and all of the new things, it's, you can't change the mountains, you don't change the air, you can't change the trees or the sunshine, and it's just as beautiful as always. Absolutely. That, that seems like a pretty nice way to wrap this up. John, did you, was there anything that you think we missed that you, we, you would ask? Uh, I, I'm sort of curious about you know, you live here full time. What do you do that day? What, what's your, what? So many people will say to me, well, you live in Aspen. What do you do all day? Well, what do they do all day? I'm living in my home, in my hometown. Our days are. I have are, chores and business and things I have to attend to. Well, our days are filled up all yeah, the time. It would be, it'd be the same if I lived in Los Angeles or New York. I'd be doing the same things. I'm just in a better atmosphere and a prettier place. Fortunately. Very. Very fortunately. How would you be different if you stayed in Hollywood, if you were living in Bel Air or? Well, I lived in Bel Air. Yeah, so did I. We both lived in Bel Air. I think that Aspen has softened my rougher edges. I think I might be tougher if I lived, say, in what you would call Hollywood, what I would call LA, because I think you had to be. And I think in Aspen, most people, if they <coughs> truly embrace the nature here, they can find their true selves. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, it's the cottonwoods. <laughs> That's one thing about Aspen I you don't know, I, like. I also think, you know, um, Jill was born in L.A. I was raised in L.A. We have all of our business there, and agents family. and families, and our daughters live there. and It's all, you know. And we go back uh, probably once a month and spend maybe a week with uh, the grandchildren and, and the kids. And, and if I'm working, I'm obviously there. But uh, talk about being impacted. I mean, Los Angeles changed so much for us from when we were kids and grew up there. I mean, my my grand our grandson can't even ride his bike on the on the sidewalk. Well, that, that's you true know, that in, in, in uh, all cities, in though, all you know, when we grew up, and I bet you were the same, your mother said, go outside and play. You can say that in Aspen, but you can't say that in any city in the world anymore. We had a curfew as kids, you know, we had to be home in time for dinner and all that, but we could be out and play all day long. You can't do that anymore, in, in, as Jill said, in most big cities. That's a very difficult thing to do. Security was never a situation, you know. Security now is a tremendous industry. And, uh, you know, you don't have that sense here. You know, no. you, when you live here, kind of everybody's with you. You know, you turn to somebody and they'll... Well, also, you know, when we, we, we built this, this last house that we have, and we've been in it, almost 18 years now and for the first six months we didn't have locks they just did they were special order and they didn't come we slept just fine we didn't have locks on our doors and the house that I had on McLean Flats I rarely locked you know eventually you figured out you had to do it because times had changed but it was much easier then, but it's still wonderful. I don't want to be one of those people who complains about how it was then and how it is now. Yeah. It's still great. And there's a generation of people who will look back 30 years from now and say it was so great then, but look what they've done now. That's uh, life. That's you know, progress. And, and to be, to compare, you know, that's one of the things we don't, you and I don't do mm -hmm. that. We don't compare, oh, what it was like. Don't you remember it was so wonderful then and that? We, you live in Together, the moment. Together, we're trying to live in the moment, to live now, this moment. And that is a very important thing if you can do it. It's not easy sometimes, but. Are you younger because you're here? Are you? Oh, I think so. I think for me. I think I'm we're going to live longer because we're here. I'm convinced of that. Oh, yeah. Well, last question. 
Do, does Aspen have a soul? Would you, what, what's the soul of Aspen? What, what's the essence of this place? Um, that's, that's what is the soul of, of Aspen? Aspen? I think the soul, of, well, the soul of Aspen is uh, the people that live here and that were here that we're here, so important. They're we have a ghost of a soul you know. here. We have the people, the originators, the people who founded Aspen, made it what it became, and then we have other people that came and tried. There is a soul. Aspen's soul will never die. It gets mutated on occasion. So I think of it as a ghost of a soul, but we still we still have a soul here. That's that's good. I think I, I think that was terrific. I, I oh, hope thanks. you guys are happy. I'm um, happy. I'm I happy. knew you'd ask good questions. Well, they're they're very general and open. Um, if there's anything you, you you would like to say that we haven't talked about, I think we covered. I think we covered all bases. You know, it's not about us. It's about you know. Yeah, I think that we I think we paid a tribute to this wonderful place that we live. Yeah, I think and it was great. We are going to be buried here. They're carrying really? me out of here feet first. Yep. Did you get that? Yeah. Okay, that's great because that 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 you want to spend eternity here is a incredibly powerful statement to me. And not go back to well, that's it. Hollywood or your home. Oh your no, th you this is it. Is. Oh, this is it. Great. And I'm really proud and happy about it. Very, very happy about it. And you know, I nev we never go anywhere in the world, and we do travel extensively, that we don't run into someone we knew at one point from Aspen. I'm sure you've traveled so much. Hasn't that happened to you a lot? I have met Aspenites in the most unusual places. Yeah. I mean, Walking around a corner in, in Paris in the in the uh, Picasso Museum, and then there's people that you know from here. What well, oh, every place I've gone, it seems like I run into somebody from here. Absolutely. But it is it is a uh, it it it's unique. It's it's unique. It's a city of the world, and in, in, I think anyway. Big city people inhabiting a small town. Big minds. Big sure ideas. is different. Sure is different. When I came into Aspen, I came in on a DC three, and the Bert Simons was probably flying. Right, it. and it was right up Highway eighty two. Landed at the airport. Quonset hut at Quonset the airport. Quonset huts, you know, and I never thought I'd be driving down Highway eighty two and looking at all of that hardware and all those private airplanes that are on the strip parked. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, but it's what's happened. It's Everywhere. what's happened to our life and the world we live in. I'm not talking about they the world of They call it progress, Aspen, but, but I'm know, not so sure it's progress. Everywhere. I mean, when you land at an airport, you know, and you look out and you see all of those planes, all of those planes, just in one airport. Gigantic private planes, billions Amazing. of dollars of planes sitting there. Amazing, you know. Travel, technology, they've invaded a lot of Aspen. But let's what, what's interesting about that here. is that they decided to come here. There's a conference um, this month which is called the Global Sports Summit, and all the owners of all the leagues and their CEOs, uh, and I'm talking about the, you know, the NFL guys, all, all those power brokers, guys who own the soccer teams in Europe, they come here. Mm -hmm. And remember when um, uh, Little and what's, what was his partner's name? Um, oh, Ted Forsman. Forsman, thank you. He had that some of the most powerful financial guys in the world. Teddy Forsman, he we created that. We just had the that Ideas Festival, and we had uh, huge people of enormous power uh, that control media, that control business, and they come here. here. And we also They're have wonderful brains. musicians yeah. who come here. Great artists that come great here. Great artists who come here. That's what's so fantastic about I, I wouldn't about this be place. surprised if someone years from now finds a gigantic cobalt deposit somewhere here in these mountains because there is a magnetism 
that brings these big brains to this little town. What a privilege. Uh, I don't I'd like to go one place. Yeah, um, you said that it takes, you have to be patient to, for, for aspirin. Wait, to, to, to wait accept. for it, yeah. Wait mm -hmm. for it, wait for it. And today it's, nobody wants to wait for anything. No, immediate gratification is and, what and most people. And this still place still, you know, I, I always said it takes 10 years to become a local and then it takes 20 years for the locals to actually acknowledge that you're a local. Well. Look, if you, if if you're lucky enough, if if you're who is that, Shlomo? Yeah. Hi, Shlomo. Do you still love me, or have you found another guy? I always love. I I asked you to bring cheesecake. I don't know. If you, what I was going to say is, if if you have, if you're fortunate enough to wait long enough, maybe and hopefully you'll get it. And if you get it. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. I think we're good. You have a question? You know, you have a question like, is this better than Haifa? <laughs> <laughs> Don't compare us. Is it all going to be Jewish questions to you? It's all going to be <laughs> Jew <laughs> questions. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I've been studying Yiddish all week, so I can talk to <laughs> That is my favorite language in the world. Oy. And a couple Oy. of years ago, I bought, Leo Rostin had written a book called The Joys of Yiddish, and he it was amended and reprinted a couple of years ago. So it didn't just give American Yiddish, it gave German, Polish, Russian Yiddish. And I laughed from one, from page one to the very end. It's the most fun book I've Jill, ever read. Jill, what was the name of the play that was on in uh, New York that was so popular about the Jewish humor or how to? Oh yeah, I can't remember Well, there that? was a, a old, Old Jews telling jokes. It yeah, that's it. I think old that's what. Old Jews what. telling jokes. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to see it. No. I, what a great language. I'm a celebrated skier, folks, and qualified to smirk. I've skied more hills than any man from Frisco to New York. But talking about the skiing I've done is my one and only quirk.